to me. Talk them to me. Hello, everyone. I'm Rebecca, and I would like to officially welcome you to Talk Climate to Me, Episode 1, the online edition. Talk Climate to Me is a course that centers the stories and experiences of women. When we say women, we mean that in the most expansive sense of the word, including trans women, two-spirit people, and, and gender minorities. We recognize that gender is not a binary, and that climate concern is not tied to any specific identity. If you are someone who cares about people and our planet, then we think you'll get something out of it. So truly welcome everyone. We're here to learn and have fun. Just to, let, uh, just to let you know that we've created a worksheet for those of you who like to take physical notes, and the link to that is in the video description. I'd like to start today by acknowledging that wherever we are, the ground beneath our feet is unceded territory of Indigenous peoples, many of whom have been displaced by settlers. I'm currently near Orangeville, which is the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, Piton, Anishinaabe, and Mississauga peoples, including treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit. This land is now home to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people from across Turtle Island. With deep gratitude, the Talk Climate to Me team acknowledges that Indigenous communities have been stewarding these lands for millennia and recognizes their struggles today on the front lines of climate action as land defenders and water protectors. As a settler on these lands, I'm grateful for the lessons offered so generously about living in right relationship with the rest of the natural world. And we also recognize that the onus is on us as settlers to learn about the ongoing traumas of colonization. We invite all of our participants to connect with the lands you're living on and to commit to learning more about Canada's colonial history. We have a number of resources to support you on our website, www.talkclimatetome.ca slash resources. All right. This course is offered by Project Neutral. Our organization's goal is to help people and communities understand their climate impacts and to take action. We're our project on MakeWay's shared platform. MakeWay is a national charity that builds partnerships and solutions to help nature and communities thrive together. We have a dedicated and amazing Talk Climate to Me team at Project Neutral. We think it's important to note, though, that we are largely a group of cis white women. We can't solve the climate crisis without everyone at the table, and lack of diverse representation is a huge issue in environmental work. In developing this course, we engaged Black, Indigenous, and other people of color as reviewers, and you'll hear from a diverse group of amazing women throughout the course. But we want to acknowledge that we still have work to do. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the next episode as well. Talking about our team and amazing reviewers, we'd like to thank the many people who helped create this course. First, thanks to Canada's Climate Action and Awareness Fund for supporting this project, and to the at least 78 people who have helped us shape this course. From amazing reviewers, to guest speakers, to artists who made our videos, we had so many people contribute to creating this amazing course, and we feel so, so grateful. A special shout out to Sarah Lazarevich, who created the idea of Talk Climate to Me, and you'll see her creative touch throughout the episodes. Okay, so here's how this works. We have four 30 to 40 minute online episodes that comprise Talk Climate to Me. Today, for episode one, we're going to ease in gently. We know people are starting from different levels of knowledge, so we're going to cover the basics of climate change. By the end of today, we'll be on the same page and ready to dive into meteor content together next time. Episode two is all about empathy for all of those affected by climate change, plus understanding our own impacts. Episode three is all about systems change and how we can make it happen. Finally, episode four is all about creating a flourishing future for society as a whole and within our own lives. To complement these episodes, we have a bunch of really awesome resources for you, which are in many of which are in the video description. And um, I'll go through a few of them at the end of the episode. I do want to say that sometimes we're going to cover some hard stuff. We are talking the climate crisis after all. Some of it might feel uncomfortable, but we'll also laugh a bit and share some cute kitten pics and some pretty hopeful stories. Our goal is to leave you feeling confident in your understanding of the issue and that you can make a positive difference. Before we get into it, we invite you to give yourself the gift of slowing down. 
and of being present. So to help us set aside the day's busyness for a moment, we'll start each episode by taking a couple of breaths to help settle us into our time together. I invite you to close your eyes if you'd like and give yourself a moment to quiet your mind and to sink back down into your body. Let's take three big deep breaths together, feeling your breath going deep into your belly on the inhale and letting go of any distractions on the exhale. In your own time, take two more deep breaths. All right, when you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes. I hope you're feeling a little more grounded. See if you can hold on to that feeling and carry it, carry it with you into our session today. Okay, so why are we doing this? Why a course designed specifically for women? Well, we know women are more worried about climate change, but less confident in their knowledge and less comfortable talking about it. We also know women care. We hear every day from women who want to do the right thing, but don't know if their actions are making a difference. We also know that women play a vital role in climate solutions. We tend to take climate risks more seriously. In fact, in Canada, women are 12% more likely to believe we're facing a climate emergency than men. So enter Talk Climate to me. Again, we want to help you feel confident about this big issue and supported and excited in taking action. Did you know that when women are involved in climate decisions, we get better outcomes? Countries with more women in politics are more likely to ratify climate agreements. And you know what's wild? Researchers found that countries where women have higher political status actually have lower carbon emissions. They create less climate pollution per capita even when you control for GDP and other factors. We also know that it's women, particularly women of color, who are out on the front lines leading grassroots efforts to protect our air, water, and climate, although these efforts don't get as much attention as they deserve. Improving gender equality, racial equity, and generally getting more women involved in climate action are critical parts of solving the climate crisis. Now, obviously, women have lots of lots on their plate already. And this isn't about saddling one group with the, you know, kind of enormous responsibility of saving all of humanity, but also let's be real, who gets stuff done? So if you're a woman contemplating the climate crisis, you are needed, you are awesome. So let's do this. In fact, Talk Climate to Me was inspired by groups of women coming together to create a safer world for all. Science Moms is one example. Here's one of their videos showing why later is too late to act on climate. As a scientist, I know by the time she takes her first breath, nine billion more tons of carbon pollution will be in the air. When she takes her first steps, wildfires will have burned millions more acres she could have explored. By the time a child born today goes to college, it may be too late to leave them the world we promised. Our window to act on climate change is like watching them grow up. We blink and we miss it. <sighs> As an aunt, that video hits me every single time because I truly want to secure a climate safe world for my nieces and nephew. And of course, this isn't just for moms or aunts. You don't need to have a child of your own to want to leave a healthy world for everyone. So we're running this course because there's so much at stake and we don't have much time to act. All right. We are truly about to get into the meat of things for episode one. And maybe this is the first time you're really digging into this issue, or maybe you've tried to bring up your fun facts about climate before and it hasn't gone so well. That's okay. Regardless of however much or little you know, we want to know you are welcome here at Talk Climate to Me. In fact, we asked some people in Toronto what they knew about climate, and here's what they had to say. Who do you think creates more carbon emissions on average, men or women? I'd say probably women. Maybe women. Women, maybe? You know what? Every woman has said that, including myself, because I also thought that. Uh, because, you know, we, we are forced to buy all these products that we don't want to buy because of society. However, it's men. Men do. Men do. I see. That is very shocking. Very, very shocking. And I say this not to dog men, but to encourage y'all 
to do less wastage and to encourage the women to keep us in the winning place for those who create the least. Right? Yeah. That's what's up. In your opinion, do you think that Canada is doing a good job on climate change? I don't think I'm informed enough to know that. I'm glad that we do, you know, separate garbage. At least that's something that we do here. Totally. I'm originally from Mexico and that's definitely not a thing that's done there. Right. And I feel like people here are a lot more conscious, but I don't know if there's specific programs like that Canada has enforced to do something about global warming. You see, most of us can hardly name what our country is doing to act on climate. And it's not our fault. Most of us weren't taught this in school. So don't feel bad if you don't feel confident in your knowledge yet. We know there are lots of questions out there. So we wanted to start off with some of the basics. So what's climate change? All you really need to know is that pollution is causing the planet to warm. This pollution is caused by the burning of fossil fuels, things like coal, oil, and natural gas. These release carbon dioxide and other gases. These gases act like a heat trapping blanket around the planet. That's where the term greenhouse gas or GHG comes from. When carbon dioxide and other gases are emitted, they trap heat like in a greenhouse. And the more the greenhouse gases, the thicker the blanket and the more the planet heats up. Okay, great. But like, what does that actually mean for us? Well, we reached out to Dr. Kim Nicholas, a world leader on climate solutions from Lund University in Sweden. Her book, Under the Sky We Make, How to Be a Human in a Warming World, helps people understand where they fit into solving the climate crisis. You already met Alia Kanani. When she's not stopping people on the streets of Toronto, she's a comedian and creator. Like a lot of you, she's curious about climate, but not totally sure what it all means. She had a few questions for Kim, and in five minutes, Kim's going to walk Aaliyah through what she needs to know. Basically all the climate science you need to know fits in a haiku. If you don't count syllables too carefully. <laughs> so it's, it's warming, it's us, we're sure, it's bad, we can fix it. This is a journey. This feels like a journey, this haiku of yours. Uh, but who doesn't love a good haiku? You know what I mean? Let's Especially go on a journey together. I mean, let's go through it. Sick. Okay. All right. So let's start with it's warm. I got to be honest with you, Kim. I read that and I was like, fantastic. <laughs> loving it. Loving the warmth. <laughs> the world is getting warmer. It's a little over one degree Celsius warmer than it has been on average for the last 10,000 years. And we can see that in melting ice, we can see it in rising sea levels, we see it on land and in the oceans, it's getting hotter. When you say one degree, I feel like that doesn't seem like a lot to be concerned about, but I feel like maybe you could explain that to me why I should worry about a degree. Sure. Well, when, I, when I'm talking about one degree, it's a global average. And you can think about the health of the planet is tied to this temperature in the same way the health of your body is tied to your body temperature. And we use a thermometer as an indicator of how are you feeling? So one degree Celsius above your normal body temperature, that would be, you feel a little off, you have a fever. Two degrees warmer, you're sick, you need to go to the doctor. And if we're talking about three or four degrees warmer for your body, you are in the hospital. It's really serious. The planet is already one degree above the planet has a fever now the planet has a fever and if we keep going the planet's going to be in the hospital now that i know that the warming thing is not a good thing <laughs> it's us it's us as human beings and the main thing we're doing to cause climate warming is burning fossil fuels like coal oil and gas and the problem with fossil fuels is that when we burn them we're releasing that carbon that took, you know, millions of years to accumulate basically in a second. I don't want to sound doubtful when I say the following. Are we sure? <laughs> so there really is no doubt anymore. And when you think about 
how hard it is to get anybody to agree for anything, like five people get together, what should we have on a pizza? Try getting 195 countries together who have quite different interests and histories, but the evidence is so strong that no one could doubt the word or say, you know, protest against the word unequivocal for human cause warming. It seems like it's all happening so fast now, right? It feels like it's like, it's almost, it feels like accelerated. And I'm like, it's just a matter of time before, you know, I see direct impact in my life. The impacts of climate change are accelerating and they are widespread. We're already experiencing lower food production than we would without climate change. So the warming so far has already decreased yields and making it harder for farmers to make a living and harder to grow the food that we need. And it's increasing economic inequality between rich and poor countries. So climate change is basically slowing the development for the countries that are already being the most impacted by climate change. So it's bad, uh, but we can fix it. Yes, we can. Okay. That's, I love hope. Hope is, hope is great. So tell me how, how do we, what do we do? What do I do? We have to do two things to fix it. And by fix it, I mean, stop warming. So we need to leave fossil fuels in the ground and switch from switch to agriculture and food production that is working with instead of against nature. Everybody has to do their part, governments, businesses, and individuals, we have a role too. Governments are the ones who set policies. So they have to stop making it cheaper and easier to extract and burn fossil fuels than the clean alternatives. Businesses have to see the writing on the wall and be moving away from fossil fuels and towards energy sources that do not destroy the climate. And as individuals, we have a role to play too, because even though it's true that companies have a huge share of emissions, most emissions are actually under household control. Thanks for being so open to sharing with me and, and breaking it down into uh, easier terms for me to digest. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
but I'm not so into the it's bad though. It is serious. Remember, the pollution we've already created will keep heating the planet for at least another 20 to 30 years. And unless we ramp up climate action fast, we're still on track for more than two, even three degrees of warming. That puts the planet in the hospital. As Homer says, this isn't the hottest summer of your life. This is the coldest summer of the rest of your life. <laughs> Thanks, Homer. <laughs> I'm curious, when you think of the future, what do you imagine it will be like? Take a moment to think of a word that sums this up. You know, a lot of people feel despair, scared, angry, and honestly, the climate crisis leaves a lot of us feeling overwhelmed. In fact, a survey last December found that 40% of Americans felt helpless about climate change and 29% felt hopeless. And as Kim said, it's bad and that's true, but it's only one part of the story. There are actually reasons to hope if we kick into action. We know it can be pretty hard to imagine a good future, but part of this course is to show that it's actually possible. Let's take a moment to imagine it. Three, two, one. We've magically transported ourselves to the year 2050. How old will you be then? We meet Jamie. She joined the climate movement in her 40s to demand a better future. And she tells us how the world has changed. What do I remember about 2022? Hmm. Fear. Fear of COVID. The fear of each other. Fear of the future. The fires. I mean, my God, fish cooking in the oceans. And then the code red climate report. Things had gotten so bad, so fast. Floods, fires, droughts, hurricanes happening all across the globe, all at the same time. But it, it finally sank in, it finally meant things had to change and the world leaders they were still not acting fast enough they were still helping big oil to squeeze the last drops of profit out of the ground so we took to the streets and when i say we i mean all of us not just the quote-unquote radicals I went to the first rally of my life in 2022, but it was not the last. The challenges seemed insurmountable, but you know what? People stayed in the streets until things changed. And then, boy, did things change. A rapid, accelerating, almost unbelievable change. It was incredible to be part of it. We felt like we were living through the most exciting time in human history. And it, it took me a while to get over my fear, my fear of change. But fear wasn't necessary. What was necessary was openness and hard work. And the oil sands were over, but there were plenty of new jobs because there was so much to do. And there were so many so many jobs in infrastructure that they were hard to fill. Houses had to be retrofitted with heat pumps and insulation. Public transit was scaled up, with people no longer thinking train was a dirty word. And cities added bicycle lanes for all the new cyclists. And, and, and parking lots were turned into gardens for local communities to grow food and enjoy life. There was a time when I didn't know my neighbors very well. But after the flood of 2023, we became very close. And we'd all pitched in to help one another when we were without power for weeks. And after that, we worked together to create this, this beautiful, friendly street with lots of outdoor seating and 
greenery. I even bake things for my neighbors, and they help me when I need it. And sometimes we jam. I'm learning to play the electric bass. <laughs> the future isn't what we expected. It isn't a world of flying cars and metallic mini skirts. It's more like we got rid of the bad, unhealthy things that had created the crisis. And we kept the best parts of the world that we know and love. Getting rid of the bad and keeping the good? That actually sounds pretty sweet to me. And I love how people are already living the future. Like, did you see that garden? It's really important to remember this, you know, positive, optimistic part of the climate narrative. So if you need, pause this video for 15 to 20 seconds to really absorb and think about what you noticed about Jamie's future or what you are excited about when it comes to achieving a climate safe future. It's so important to remember this part of the climate narrative and to realize that change is actually happening. My colleague Katie was in Montreal last summer and there was a dingy alley behind her old apartment. You can see it on the left there. But as you can see on the right, it had been turned into this lovely green path. It was an incredible transformation and it's wild to imagine that we could just do that across all of our cities. But maybe imagining a green urban oasis sounds a little far-fetched. Like sure, an alley is nice, but how could that actually happen at the scale we're talking about? But let's think about it another way. It's not just one alley. In Montreal specifically, the Green Alleyway Program has converted more than 450 alleyways and greening programs are actually underway in all kinds of cities. Think about all the actions people are taking and the changes they're making. They add up and they're changing the larger system. And again, we are starting to see signs of real change. Renewables became the cheapest form of new energy in 2020. Pension funds and major institutions like Harvard are divesting from fossil fuels. And electric vehicles are pretty much becoming the norm as countries start to phase out internal combustion engine vehicles. And what we really want to emphasize throughout Talk Climate to Me is that this change is actually propelled by the actions of people like you and me. You may know climate advocates like Greta Thunberg, David Suzuki, even Elliot Page and Billie Eilish. But for every Jane Goodall and Jane Fonda, there are thousands of everyday leaders like you and me. And in this course, we'll introduce you to some change, change makers who are creating a better future today. In fact, we actually asked a few young climate champions to tell us how they got started. How to find your way into this issue that needs so much help and seems so overwhelming. We asked a bunch of climate leaders how they got started. Writes Maria, I was in grade 12 when Calgary saw some of the biggest floods in our history, and I saw the impacts of a changing climate firsthand. I landed a job in environmental education upon graduating, and I got the opportunity to work on a youth narratives project that aimed to help education agencies and teachers better understand climate energy language and approaches that resonate with youth audiences. Writes Katie, when I was a teenager, I got my first summer job working at a provincial park. It was the first time that I really connected with nature. I loved learning about wildlife and the natural world so much that I pursued a career in environmental education. Writes Brianna, our journey to start Carbon Conversations TO began as a simple coffee chat. When a group of like-minded people get together to solve a problem dear to their hearts, that is how change begins. Writes Jasmine, I started my sustainability journey full force after watching Al Gore's The Inconvenient Truth at 12 years old. To this day, as a sustainability coordinator, I'm focused on how we can make the planet better for today and future generations. Writes Miranda, since childhood, I have been fascinated by the natural world. Learning about wildlife and how to protect it through biodiversity conservation was my main passion that led me to study environmental studies in university. After graduation, I realized that local action truly does make a difference globally, and that's why I co-founded the Community Climate Council, a nonprofit climate organization based in Brampton, Ontario, that empowers our community to take local climate action. Ah, uh, 
These women are so amazing. I'm so glad they're out there doing the work they're doing. But what if you didn't get started quite so early? Like maybe it was a bit past your high school years when Al Gore's movie came out. Is it too late to get involved? We wanted to introduce you to Una. She told us that climate wasn't really on her radar, but then she took a precursor of Talk Climate to me from our colleague, Sarah, and things changed. Okay, so the truth is, I was never really that worried about climate stuff. I mean, I wasn't a total jerk or anything. I would recycle or pick the, you know, bottle of cleaner with the leaf on it or whatever. But I didn't, I didn't really think that the climate crisis was up to me. Like, I'm a personal trainer. Surely someone is working on this. Like, I would, you know, you'd see stuff in the paper and stuff like that. I wasn't a complete ignoramus, but I would assume, or I did assume, that if this is a real problem, then, you know, they'll crack down on us. Like, if, if the... If it's really a bad idea for us to fly, then they will make flying illegal. If we all need to completely change our lifestyles, then they will tell us so. They being like the government, scientists, whatever, and they will make it so that we all have to do that. So I've seen governments mobilize before, for example, COVID pandemic, and you know, you've heard examples in wars. So I figured, all right, well, you know, just looking around, it doesn't really look like it's an emergency. Here we all are driving cars and buying way too much stuff and if that is going to prevent humanity from existing then surely someone will stop us and so that's where i was at with it you know living my life and trying not to be a total jerk to the earth but also living my life and then i did sarah's webinar and it just really hit home like it never had before that oh my gosh it is up to me it's up to like all of us because really we're in a bad situation and the government is not doing stuff. And um, that sense of shifting responsibility from, I don't know, someone else, some expert, some government to myself was a big shift. And I'm still trying to um, figure that out a little bit. But to be honest, it was such a huge shift that I decided to make this my new part-time job. And I advocating for climate, talking about climate, um, doing everything I can to mobilize other people is now really what I'm most passionate about. Yes, we need more people like Una in this world who are realizing it is up to us and making that shift. It's not too late to start. As they say, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time, right now. Okay, so how do we start? Hint, it's on the slide. Talking about climate with your people is actually one of the most powerful things you can do. But we don't mean sitting someone down to persuade them to change their ways. And it's definitely not arguing with climate deniers on the internet. Not worth your time. Don't feed the trolls. No, frankly, it's not about persuading anyone at all because that do just doesn't work. You know what does work? Showing your friends, family, running buddies, book club members, whomever, all the people for whom you are a trusted messenger, showing them that people like you care and want to see action. Why? Because do you know who we tend to trust the most when it comes to new information? The people we know. Climate scientist, Dr. Catherine Hayo says, talking about climate knocks over the very first domino in the chain of social change. So when we say talk climate, we mean letting your care for people on the planet shine through. Don't hide it. Let others know that this is important to you. It means telling your friends about the actions you're taking. And it means posting about it online and talking about it in line at the grocery store. This seems so simple, but it's powerful. Now, maybe you're thinking, fine, talking sounds kind of useful, but I'm not ready to talk climate. I don't know enough yet. Let's think about what we covered today. Kim shared with Aaliyah that it's warming, it's us, we're sure, it's bad, and we can fix it. We captured our takeaways from the video that we can now share with others. We imagined that in 2050, we'd gotten rid of the bad stuff that got us into, the, into this mess and built lush, green, community-minded spaces. And we were introduced to some changemakers who are leading this transformation. 
And then finally, we talked about why talking climate is one of the most surprisingly effective things you can do to unlock social change. You've actually covered a lot of ground already. So for those of you who are just starting to learn about this, I hope you feel like you've got a good foundation to start from. And if you're thinking, that was nice, but I'm craving more. Don't worry, we get right into it next time. So for Talk Climate to Me, at the end of each episode, we're going to leave you with some calls to action. Today, you're invited to stay connected with us online at, at Talk Climate to Me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We also encourage you to find out more about the peoples, languages, and treaties where you live. You can check out www.whose.land as well as native-land.ca. <laughs> Next, share Kim and Aaliyah's video alongside your takeaways. And if you share online, use the hashtag TalkClimateToMe so we can see it. Finally, tell someone why climate is, is important to you. All right, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, uh, we have a bunch of awesome resources for you. Many of them are in the video description, and I'm just going to go through some of them here. If you want the references for today's episode, they're over on the we website under resources, so www.talkclimatetome.ca slash resources. We also know there's a lot of wisdom out there in Talk Climate to Me participants, so if you've got anything you want to share, add it directly to the participant resources worksheet. Again, the link is in the description, uh, the video description. And for those of you who want to keep learning, check out our What's On Doc for a list of upcoming climate events. I love sharing this time with you today, but also I'm so excited for you to head on over to the other episodes. For episodes two, three, and four, head over to Project Neutral's main YouTube page, and we have a Talk Climate to Me episode playlist ready for you. All right, that's it for now. Happy talking climate and see you next time. Bye.